Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, the continuation of our Spring 2024 series of Tuesday Times Roundtable. Today's session, Connect, Care, Conserve, How Zoo Miami Creates Community Impact. My name is Michelle Zaldivar, your program manager here at the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. TTR is our flagship discussion series that brings together multiple perspectives on current global issues and trends. You can learn more about TTR, watch past recordings, or come back and watch this one at go.fiu.edu slash TTR. If you haven't already, absolutely please take a minute to sign in. This QR code is where we report back attendance. So whether you're here for some honors college points, global learning medallion engagement points, um, uh, extra credit for a professor, we're glad you're here joining us. Uh, this QR code is absolutely where you report that. My medallion students make sure to take a screenshot of the confirmation of your sign in so that you can use that on your verification log. I encourage you to, if you want to learn more about our undergraduate programs at the Office of Global Learning Initiatives, that other QR code will take you straight to our Instagram. That is hub for where we promote uh, different kinds of engagement points, capstone opportunities, all of that jazz. If you have any questions about those programs, we'll also be hanging out after the session. The uh, two graduate assistants that you met in the front and Connie Penzak, our assistant director in charge of student programs, will be glad to answer any of your questions. As always, TTR is linked to a news article, and that is because you, as FIU students, have free digital access to the New York Times with your at FIU.edu email address. So if you'd like to hear the uh, read the article that is linked in some way to our discussion today, you can do that at go.fiu.edu slash TTR0220. That's February 20th, today's date, right? Uh, if you hit a paywall, Go to accessnyt.com, use your at fiu.edu email address, and activate your free subscription. Do you want to get into some more undergraduate research? There are lots of undergraduate research opportunities happening at FIU in the coming weeks. Those deadlines are coming up very quickly. There's three upcoming opportunities for you to showcase your work to, and connect with under undergraduate students in the research community here at FIU. Deadlines to submit those works, uh, those proposals are March uh, 1st and 15th, depending on which platform you'd like to do. So I encourage you to look for those on calendar.fiu.edu. Especially as a Miami native born and raised, I am so excited for today's session presented by the team at Zoo Miami that is doing some extraordinary work in our community. Uh, Zoo Miami is also the largest zoo in Florida, if you did not know, and a cornerstone institution here at Miami. So leading our session today, I will introduce to you uh, our, the programs manager, the interactive programs manager at Zoo Miami, Rob Lara. Starting with his passion for wildlife, Rob studied wildlife ecology and conservation at the University University of Florida, we won't hold that against him, and began a career as a field technician for wildlife research. After 18 months, he realized that he also had another goal, sharing his passion for wildlife. This led him to the zoo world, and as a zookeeper, Rob believes strongly that conservation happens every day through engaging guests and caring for zoo animals so they can serve their purpose as ambassadors. After 11 years with the zoo, Rob focuses on leading guest engagement in the animal department at Zoo Miami and co Coaching other zookeepers to share their passions as well. So please join me in welcoming Rob Lara. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, so I am super excited to be up here today. You know, we came, we made the arduous trek through Miami traffic to, to be with you. We found parking in your amazing full garages to, uh, to come over here. We walked through your beautiful campus, um, which was super nice. So um, it has been a wonderful experience working with FIU and the number of different ways that we work with you guys at the zoo. Uh, we have a few undergraduate programs that people can do undergraduate research with our conservation department. Um, and there's a few other things that um, go beyond that that we're gonna talk about today. But the big thing that we are is we, we are the zoo for you. We are the community zoo for Miami. There are other people that have animals and, and uh, charge people to come in. Um, but we're here today to kind of express to you all of the intricate details of what being your zoo means. And also explaining that the conservation work that we do is not an afterthought. It is the first thing that we focus on. So um, in order to kind of get into that, the, the, the thing I wanted to make sure you guys um, first gather from our experience today is that Zoo Miami is here for a reason. You know, we have a purpose and we have a, a direction that we're moving. Um, and in our, in our world, we call that our vision, you know, our vision. And so 
it has changed over time and we've recently come up with a new version of that vision um, to guide us really into the next few years. Um, and each, you know, five, 10 years, it's always important that you really look at the, the existential question of why are we here? What are we doing? And, um, and what's our purpose? And so for, for Zoo Miami, our vision, which by the way is um, the vis same vision of our Florida Panther, Mahala. Um, you guys can all say, hi, Mahala. She's, she's looking off into the sky right now. She's beautiful. Um, I, I, I get the, the pleasure of uh, sometimes working with the animals still. So I really enjoy uh, sharing their stories and their, and their stuff. But we'll get into that later. So our vision is to unite everyone with nature to protect and restore wildlife. That's a big goal, right? And it's something that we really have to take to heart every single time we step onto the guest path because otherwise we wouldn't have guests if that wasn't our goal, right? The, the purpose of uniting people with nature um, is something that goes beyond just making sure that our daily tasks are completed, right? So when we go through our vision and we start thinking about how we're going to accomplish that and how we're going to take those steps towards the future, we are guided by our mission, which is really how we do how we serve that purpose. What are we doing? So we inspire people through engaging experiences, which is mostly my thing. And then we, we, we inspire people through those engaging experiences to preserve nature in South Florida and across the globe. And so part of that is always connecting people with what we're doing, um, with the animals that are here, with the people that are here serving them or doing our jobs, but also helping them to then care not only about the animals and why they're here and, and what their role is in their ecosystem, but then also how we care for them, explaining the different things that we do to make sure that the animals living at our zoo, our community zoo, trying to inspire people to care about nature and to um, take action to help it, that they have those experiences with happy, healthy animals, right? On a clean guest path, in a safe place, with a well um, choreographed or well planned out message that we all work towards. So, um, so we, we do these things as I said, through our main principles, which are connecting, caring, and conserving. And it's important to know that there's, there's plenty of places that you can just Google questions about animals, right? There's plenty of ideas that you might have and you might, oh, you know, let me just throw it on the Google and I'll find out, you know, how many teeth a shark has or I'll find out how many eggs a ball python lays. Um, but when you come to Arzu, you're not just learning a fact. You're having an experience. You're meeting an animal you're meeting a person, and you're having a great time. And that's what our, all of our steps along the way kind of lend themselves to. Um, and the important thing is that everybody has their spectrum that they're on, right? I, I love zoos, I wanna be there, I wanna go, I wanna do this, or I'm just looking for a good time, right? And so it's our job to take every experience that you have and to help you take one more step towards our purpose of being here, which is to connect you with nature, to inspire you to wanna help it. So I get the, privilege of introducing you to the people that I brought with me today. And we're going to talk through the different things um, that I just mentioned um, from each of our specific perspectives. All right. So I'm going to start on the far end over here because I really, I cannot be more excited to introduce her to you guys. Um, but Tiffany um, is one of our um, conservation specialists at the zoo. Oh, I'm going to do this thing. Oh, look at that. Um, so <laughs> she's our conservation and research specialist at the zoo, um, representing our conservation department. Um, she graduated from North Carolina State University with uh, an environmental science major and an entomology major. Um, after graduating, she worked in various agricultural biotechnology industry companies where she bred insects that were used for bioassays, which I'm sure she'll talk to you about. Um, and then Tiffany then switched uh, to working in conservation when she moved to Miami in 2019. And she completed her forest resources and conservation master's degree in 2023 from the University of Florida. Don't hold it against her either. Um, as a Zoo Miami team member, she has published uh, papers on Lepidoptera species of butterflies and moths, research to uh, endangered Miami tiger beetle, and she collaborates with agency partners like U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the UC University of Florida. Um, so that's Tiffany on the far end there. All right, Tiffany. Um, and then also Julia Klum, um, who is our head of graphics department, and um, she got a Bachelor's of Art with a uh, 
a bachelor's in art with a minor in English literature from FIU in 2010. Oh, wow. Round of applause for Julia. Yeah, that's fine. Um, she said a lot of things about how this place used to look as we were walking in. So that was cool. We're going to do a different. whole very different. We're going to do a whole new orientation for her after we're done. Um, but uh, she started as a part time inter interactive programs attendant at Zoo Miami and found her passion for wildlife there and, um, and conservation. And then she decided to make it her career at that point. She was hired into the role of graphics and exhibits manager in 2015. Now, as the graphics manager or head of graphics, um, she is able to use her talents in art, graphic design to engage the public. And she leads a team of graphic designers in creating educational interpretive signage, marketing materials to allow guests to learn about wildlife in all new ways. Um, throughout her career at Zoo Miami, she also led the team that built the Conservation Action Center. Has anyone um, checked that out? Yeah, have you been to the, I'm going to ask this in a second. Have, a couple people are nodding their heads. I'm going to get a raise of hands here in a second. Um, and as an interactive exhibit, it opened in 2021 and it, um, it was uh, a, a masterpiece and we're very excited about it. And so she also participated in creating the zoo's interpretive plan, which we are currently um, still working on and finishing and implementing. So, um, so that is Julia. And then the, the other wonderful uh, panelist we have today is actually our zoo director, Mr. Will Elger. Um, he uh, came from the UK and is still working on the world domination thing that all UK people um, tend to have. Um, he sits in his office stroking his must. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, <laughs> so Will, uh, Will is here as well. Um, and I, I was very pleased for him to come because like if you guys want to know about Zoo Miami, you have the, you know, kind of a range of, of um, expertise and management levels. Um, people in the field most of the time, people leading a team most of the time, people kind of doing both, and then our head. So we are very excited to all three, all four of us be here today. Um, and actually, at this point, I wanted to ask you guys, before I dive into the questions that we have for each other that we're going to elaborate on and everything, I want to just get an idea for, for who's here today. So I already met Raphael, and then I met Connor, who had a midterm, I guess, he had to go to, but he came in to represent our architecture. So um, I just want to ask you, like, who's life sciences that's here right now? Biology, ecology, all of the other sciences, we're, we're gonna not head nod. Rafa's pumped, I love it. Uh, he's got one semester left. Look how excited that guy is. All right. <laughs> um, awesome, well, welcome you guys. And then um, what about business majors in here? Business, and, oh, nice, okay, cool. What are the other majors we have represented here? Psychology. Psychology, okay. What about cool. art majors? Art majors, art majors, do we have art majors? Nice, all right. You can pose all your questions to Julia, all right? <laughs> Awesome. And then, um, what other what other um, uh, departments do we have? Criminal justice. Criminal justice. Electrical engineering. Engineering. Sweet. Awesome. Very cool. I like it. So we got the whole the whole spread. I love it. Perfect. Perfect. Now, one more question before I get started. So, who's been to the zoo in the last year? Come on, hit one. Let me see. Okay. All right. And some of you in the last five years. Still a couple a couple more hands. All right. So, who's never been to the zoo so far? Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Well, I hope you guys, um, your, your, your perspective is sort of like enlightened to what we're going to talk about today. And I hope we, we drive you to either in, be interested in coming out or at least consider us a partner in whatever you're doing. All right. Very cool. All right. So we're going to get the, the party started with, uh, with a question for Will. Um, and the idea here is to get through the questions that we have for each other to kind of share our perspectives so that you guys have plenty of time to ask us questions at the end. All right. Um, we're definitely going to stick around and make sure that we make time for that. So the first question, and I'm going to ask this and then slowly go sit next to him, not awkward at all. Um, but the, the question is, the zoo's vision is about protecting and restoring wildlife. What does that mean, Will? Thank you, Rob, yes. for the loaded question to no, start with. No, um, we appreciate the opportunity to come here today, so thank you all for that. Um, and I apologize for not giving my bio, Rob. Back in the day when I was at university, we used quills and feathers and ink. So it was a long, long time ago. <laughs> so no, but our vision is in Miami. So our vision is what we strive to do. So currently we are a zoo that does conservation, but we want to be more than that. We want to move forward and be a leading conservation organization that is supported by a zoo. And we do that in many different ways. And we want to get everyone involved in how we do that. So from the start, as you walk into the, the zoo, as you come in, you purchase a ticket, you are instantly supporting conservation. Portions and percentages of those tickets go towards conservation and the work we do. 
And as it goes around, it's, it's how we help and protect wildlife. There's various different ways we do that. Parts of our rides, our concessions, our roundup for when you're purchasing stuff, all of that goes back towards conservation. And that's just the initial start of how we're doing it, apart from what we do when we actually, let me move this here, okay. uh, from what we actually do now. The amazing staff we have at the zoo, like I'm surrounded here, I'm very fortunate to have such an amazing team at the zoo. And all, all I do is facilitate what they want to do because they're the experts, they're the ones who do it. And like Tiffany, whoever here, they do on the boots, on the ground. They're, they're, they're doing the, the field work, doing the conservation work that we're part of. And of that, we, we, we want to work with release. We want to work with how we can support that. Because a lot of people see zoos, okay, we're, we're the arcs, as they say. Uh, we have the genetic uh, variability for those animals, especially for those animals that potentially are in a vulnerable state, critically endangered out in the wild. We're there to support and try and look at ways we can repatriate, uh, restore, repopulate, any way in that way. But that starts with us looking after our planet as well. We have to do that before we put animals out there because we could do that all day long. Yeah, let's put some animals back out there. But if we do that and we're not looking after the actual habitats they're in, then th that's a major issue. Right. So part of that is, is, is getting through that as we do it. And we support conservation programs throughout the world. Locally, we do quite a lot. We do quite a lot, especially around the Pine Rocklands. And uh, we do some releases. I know that Tiffany is involved in working with imperiled butterflies and releasing those back out to bolster that, especially with the Monarch Pledge, if anyone knows about that. Um, and there's been other times when, if you look at zoos in general, and we work with the industry with Arabian oryx, with black-footed ferrets, um, and now the Adax, that we're actually working with various different animals to help repopulate and, and restore those. Um, and that's part of what we do, and that's part of our vision. As say the vision is where we're striving to get to so that that vision of restoring wildlife is is key and it's not easy uh, just put it out there it's not easy to do it's hard um because there has to be generations when you do it um but i'll leave it at that for now yeah and you mentioned a couple animals does any do you guys uh, uh sometimes it's super fun we explain you know all of these things and we're talking about a desert antelope and we call it the adax or the addicts um but a lot of people have never seen one before right? Um, it's really fun when you're at the zoo and you're standing at a sign and you're seeing an animal from across the globe and that animal is staring at you and you're staring at that and then someone tells you, oh, by the way, there's more animals of that species on that on that zoo space here at Zoo Miami than there were in the wild when we searched for them last year. Oh, by the way, we funded, we helped fund that, that project and we actually sent someone to search for zebras last year and we actually sent someone to return tadpoles to the to the Costa Rican rainforest you know like those are things that we do at the zoo every single day and um and what's the number what is it right now each year that we've don donated to conservation it's around 800,000 yeah. yeah so 800, like thousand dollars yeah and so when when you mention to people like you know like hey when you came and you paid admission and you came to Zoo Miami like right then right there you take one step in you're a conservationist you did something to help wildlife today because you're supporting your zoo and your zoo is supporting wildlife because it's what we are it's what we do. Regardless of the time you had, we hope you have a good time, but regardless of the time you had, the second you step foot in the gate, you're one of us, right? So that's super important. Now, um, when, when we talk about the guests that come through, what, what do you think is the most important facet of building that connection with the guests and, and with the community? I'm sure if anyone knows, it's probably you, Rob. Yeah, it's, it's the <laughs> You've Rob seen the Laura. energy this man has. It's, it's ridiculous. But just think about that. That's infectious throughout the team that he works with as well. And that's key for these engaging experiences that we talk about. Because you can walk around, and there's been studies done this. It's like, actually, right now I'm doing my MBA, and I'm, I'm actually doing a study on actually the VIP programs and the awareness that creates conservation awareness. Um, and there's been studies done that informal education, if you're walking around and you, you read the amazing signs that uh, Julia makes, you're going to get information from that. If you add that together and actually have a connection with someone like Rob or someone out there with an animal in a meet and greet, that in itself creates an emotional connection with you. And that's what we're trying to do from a community standpoint. So the zoo itself, 70% of our guests are community. That's huge for us. We are a community resource. We are your Zoo Miami when you think about it. And with that, we've, we've got to make sure we make the effort here locally. So as we were talking about our conservation projects, yes, we do across the world, but we want to really focus local as well. And we do a lot of projects. I think it's around 34 annually we do locally. Mm -hmm. um, and we also work with that in the sense of we want to encourage people about that. So we go out to schools, we do outreach, we work with un, uh, underserved schools as well, bringing them in, trying to 
create opportunities for the youth. I have kids. I have two young kids, a two year and a four, four year old. <laughs> it's hard work. Um, but bringing them into the zoo, just seeing their reaction when they see animals and how they want to learn more and more. When we go home, they're always asking me, daddy, how, what does that animal do? And where does that come from? And how does that happen? And they, they want to do that. They create that curiosity. You create curiosity, you create the opportunity for knowledge. And with that is how we want to engage and build those connections because that's key. But that's not the only way. It's just not just kids. Of course, we, we need to look at adults and, and young professionals. So we work with different partnerships as well. We work with FWC, the Florida Wildlife Commission. We work with the National Park Service. We have them come out on the weekends mm -hmm. and actually work in our Florida Mission Everglades exhibit. Um, and we've been working with Moat recently so um, and down with their coral restoration. So there's definitely opportunities everywhere we do this. On every single level you look at, you want to make those connections. Connections. And we have to adapt to do that. We have to be adaptable. We have to have the ability to talk to different crowds and different people and make sure the information can either be at an academic level or down here at a two-year-old's level so that we can actually create that connection. Because once you have that and you move forward, that fostering of that information, that cultivating of that, in, uh, just that passion is key to living through that mission and vision. Definitely. Thank you, Will. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I will mention that, um, you know, Will started off with is his job to facilitate us doing our jobs, right? To make sure that we are well represented, that we are supported, that we are we are able to do what we're supposed to do with his input and with his support. Um, and I can say that we've we've seen a lot of growth, uh, a lot of committees that have been um, supported in a way that what it wasn't as supported before. Not necessarily because there was someone not supporting it. It just wasn't as supported. But you'll start seeing you know, Zoo Miami wildlife conservation wetsuits when the dive team goes and helps restore coral in the in the area. You'll start seeing things like you know gopher tortoise releases being publicized a lot more. That Tiffany and her team do that all the time. They do butterfly releases all the time, and so she's going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But um, I definitely wanted to say thank you, Will, and, and I'm I'm excited to to be up here with him today. So uh, I'm going to skip ahead to um, a little bit more about caring about the wildlife, uh, not only for the wildlife, but about the wildlife. And uh, I want to ask Julia the first question here. Um, like, how do we help our community to care for wildlife? I mean, that's one of our main purposes, right? Our main purpose is conservation, but it's also about people. Um, a lot of conservation issues are socioeconomic issues also. It's about connecting with people. Um, People are the ones that are going to be fighting for wildlife, are going to be changing their habits at home or at their work or within their own lives to facilitate that conservation of wildlife and of nature and of our natural world in general. Um, so participating with the community is extremely important to us. We want to participate in beach cleanups. The zoo will come out and do that. We work with, we have a really robust outreach program where we go out to high schools and middle schools and elementary schools. And we just talk about conservation. We bring animals and we really focus on building empathy, right? Especially with kids. It's not just about a snake. This is about our snake, Joe, and he's a ball python. And sometimes he likes this and sometimes he likes that. Um, getting people, not just kids, right? People to understand that each animal is an individual and build empathy for not just that in individual, but then that species as a whole. When you learn the story of addicts, for example, uh, it's a really heart-wrenching story. Addicts uh, is an animal that is now critically endangered, possibly extinct in the wild. Um, there is a good population of genetically robust species within um, Zeus under human care that are going out to repopulate. The same thing happened with Arabian oryx a while back, but being able to understand and to know those animals as individuals, maybe you didn't know that because it's it's a desert antelope, they all look the same. But when you understand more about the individuals that are part of it, either the people that are working out there trying to repatriate those animals or the individual animals that you get to meet and you realize that their personalities are completely different from each other, just like your dogs are at home, right? Each one has a different personality. Animals are the same, um, no matter what species they are. Um, and especially working around zoos and around, um, around animals, all of us understand that, but having favorites, animals like Rob's favorite is Mahala. She was just up there. She's our Florida panther. She's one of his favorite animals because she worked. he worked uh, uh, very closely with her. Um, but like I said, it's about people, right? And it's about making connections with other organizations and other people to be able to build those conservation partnerships across the world. Um, we're located in Miami. So 
it's very expensive for us to send people to Africa to do conservation work on the ground in Africa. We do that also. But we also partner with organizations that are on the ground um, living and working and breathing with those species in Africa, in South America, in Puerto Rico. We have a big problem. Pro I'm going to. You got this. <sighs> We have um, a really good program with Puerto Rican crested toads in Puerto Rico, and we have now released over 7,000 tadpoles that are born in, and raised up until tadpole era life cycle at the zoo. And then our staff go to Puerto Rico and release those animals back into the wild. There's a lot of different programs like that, but it's all about people too. It's about building relationships. And like Will said, we work with FWC. We work with um, a lot of different NGOs, with governments. Um, we work with GSMPs that are part of governments in different areas of the world to be able to build legislature that's going to protect wildlife as well. Real quick, um, that was a lot of acronyms. So GSMP, real quick, could you just explain what that is? A GSMP is a Global Species Management Plan. Um, there's nine global species management plans in the world. Um, and we work with a significant portion of those, at least four that I know of. Of. Um, and those uh, programs also work with governments to be able to connect people and governments and conservation organizations to do as much good as possible. We want to make sure that we have animals to reintroduce into the wild. We want to also make sure that there's going to be protections in place for those animals once they do get released um, and work on the socioeconomic issues of why there are conservation issues with some of those species in the first place. Right. Um, we have a lot of really cool partnerships like that and I could talk forever, which I'm not going to because <laughs> I will bore you. <laughs> she does good. She does good things with, with the boring things too. Um, it's important to know that. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it's, you know, uh, Will touched on it briefly too, that the, the important thing about being the ARC, which is what AZA zoos are, is we are the, the place that cares about these animals so that they, they are ready to go back to the wild if they ever have to be reintroduced. But the, the, the step that goes along with making sure the animals are, are um, happy, healthy, genetically diverse, and all those things in zoos is also making sure that there's a wild for them to go back to. And when she talks about socioeconomic things, it's a lot of people do what they have to do to survive, right? And so sometimes as a zoo, you gotta help the people you got to empower the people so that they can do what they have to do before you ask them like, oh, by the way, do it this way so that you can, you know, support your family. And also in doing it that way, you won't be tearing down the rainforest. Right. Um, so it's not as crazy in every single example, but at the end of the day, to help animals, you first have to help people. Um, and that's one of the big things. So um, one of the things that we do at the zoo that we're, you know, my team specializes in, but we're actually creating a whole new education department, education and interpretation um, for all of the things that we do in the zoo to kind of help people make those connections. You know, um, we heard a bunch of different um, majors in here. So like, for instance, if I was to try and connect like the bird communities that we have in Florida, like I don't even need to talk about Africa, but if we were to talk about the bird communities in Florida, my man over here said he's criminal justice, right? So like, have you ever heard of a tufted titmouse before? No, I'm going to, uh, you might want to write it down because you don't want to missay that word. But um, the tufted <laughs> titmouse is a small little gray bird that lives in our Florida songbird community. So we're talking blue jays, you know, woodpeckers, various other like, you know, um, uh, mockingbirds, the, I'm the mockingbird, those ones. Um, those, those guys live in big communities of birds, but they all have very similar enemies, right? Big owls, big hawks, a fox, you know, feral cats. And so there's this really cool thing that happens when one of those birds identifies a problem. Let, let's say there's a red shoulder hawk who just came flew in. Those, those eat other birds. Um, and he's just hanging out. Well, the tufted titmouse is the one who's like, this guy's not supposed to be here. Everybody else in this. So what'll happen is they'll do a psh, 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 and he'll start calling and he'll get everyone in. And they literally get in a big group, all different species of birds, and they take down this hawk. And by take down, I mean like scare him away, right? Um, but like, you wouldn't do that if you were a little gray bird by yourself, right? So this dude's like, yo, call the, you know, run the siren. Let's get everyone together. We go do that, right? But you guys never heard that story before, right? Because you haven't come to the freaking zoo. No, I'm kidding. 
Um, no, you haven't heard that story before because it just was never related to you in a way that made sense. You know, so whether it's the Blue Jay, who's more of like the, um, he's like the artsy fartsy one, the super smart one who can like make calls and everything. And then you have like your, your, um, your Carolina Wrens who come in and they take dust baths and the, and the different things. Like those guys are going to be like your science majors because they're like in it all over the place, right? And you have lots of different birds that serve different roles in the community, but everyone knows in the birding community, if, you, if you're a birder, you know the tufted titmouse. And you know if you want to see some cool birds, the first thing you do when you go out in the morning, it's six o'clock in the morning, the sun just came up, is go psh, 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 and all the birds will come over and be like, who, who is it? Where is he? Point him out, you know? And that's just something we know about the community. Um, so, but me explaining that to you is not about me teaching you fun little facts that you, you came in, you're like, oh, please teach me something, Rob. It was me sharing my passion for what might be inval invaluable for you to know, but at any point I made you smile, I hopefully taught you something you didn't know, and in in inevitably I taught you a little bit about our birding community, right? And it's so, really funny because you'll do this and you'll be like, where is he going with this? <laughs> is this what is happening? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I get it now. Yeah. I get you, Rob, I understand. So, you know, the point of that story is to simply say like, we have an awesome community of wildlife here in Miami. And we spend a lot of our time teaching people about the difference between Asian and African elephants. And if you don't know, the main difference is about 10,000 miles. <laughs> They're very far apart. Um, <laughs> but what I want you guys to know is that, you know, developing empathy for wildlife is not just teaching things. It's not just knowledge. It's not just education. It's interpreting things in a way that relates to you. And to you could be you, or it could be the four-year-old walking through the playground at the zoo, or it could be the family from Argentina that just got to the zoo um, at 3.30 in the afternoon and they want to make it to the giraffe platform to feed a giraffe by 4 p.m. We have a big zoo. That's an ask. So what we have to do is encourage people to, to enjoy their day at the zoo in a meaningful way. All right. So those are just some ideas of like what, what my particular field does. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit. Uh, I want to have Tiffany a chance. Um, we're going we're gonna to ask her specifically about conserving wildlife and, and how does the zoo help our community to conserve wildlife? So my background is entomology related. So all of my examples are entomology related. Um, so I have a big background with Lepidoptera. So that's just a taxonomy term that means butterflies and moths. And so um, for the community, I've done butterfly releases at the zoo. I've also partnered with uh, Fairchild uh, Botanical Garden. And so they have a program um, that... Um, I think they just changed their names. It's not Connect to Protect. It's a native plant network that they just changed their names to. Sweet. Um, I need to write that and down. so um, they have members for their plant programs. And if you have the right number of host plants for butterflies in your yard, then you can sign up to receive butterflies from us. Endangered so, butterflies. Not endangered. Very cool imperiled. imperiled butterflies from Tiffany that yeah. she breeds. Yes. So um, they're not listed as endangered, but they were once thought to have been extinct in the 60s. It's called the Atala hair streak butterfly. And so basically with our partnership with Fairchild, they're providing the plants, the host plants and nectar plants for their yard. And it's creating these little um, pockets of a population that hopefully they can uh, navigate to in between. And so um, in the 1960s, they had thought to have gone extinct. And so there were a couple of hurricanes that came through and they kind of lost their habitat on the coastline until a activist for uh, butterflies found a secret population of them on Crandon Park, which is where our zoo used to be. And he lied about that location because he didn't want any poachers to take the butterflies. And so he took them home, raised them and released them back into the same spot. And then since then, uh, the plant was protected, so then um, you couldn't dig it up from the natural areas anymore, but then you also started to see that same host plant that called the Kunti planted in landscapes throughout Miami. It's downtown. It's in front of the Hickman building, which is where our parks department um, exists downtown. And so you can find it everywhere now, and now the butterfly is considered imperiled. Um, but it's not listed as a formal threatened or endangered species, but it is kind of rare to see them. So bringing back the community aspect of it, um, when we partner with Fairchild and we partner with these homeowners that have plants in their gardens, we're making this population for a butterfly uh, valuable and, and providing habitat for them, even if it is just a backyard. 
Awesome. And what do we do in-house? Um, I know Julia and Tiffany can both speak on, speak on this, um, but conserving wildlife at the zoo in-house, what are, what are the things that we want to make sure people know? I think there's a lot of things like as an AZA zoo, AZA is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and it really is like the gold standard for zoos. We go through a rigorous um, accreditation process every five years. They look at literally everything about who we are. They look at our animal care. They look at our welfare program. They look at our nutritionists. They look at our vets. They look at our finances. They look at our interpretive programs. They look at every single thing that we do um, to make sure that we are meeting literally the best standards within the industry. Um, and so that kind of trickles down into everything that we do inside the zoo. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> how do we, how do we promote conservation ah, in house? Yes. So maybe about like, a particular like Will program said too, you participate right? like in. Everything we do is conservation. We <laughs> want to make sure that that's at the core of everything that we're putting out there in the zoo. So all of our signage, for example, is empathy building and it's about conservation. It's about how you can help. What are the things that you can do in your own life that's going to help animals or the things that can help animals in general? And some of those things are... Uh, somewhat basic, right? They are stay informed on certain issues or um, sometimes as simple as turning the tab off, like little things like that. Uh, but it's also the programs that we run. Um, the interpretive programs that we have on the walkway is making sure that we're communicating with people, but then also going out into the community. It really fits with everything that we do. And I think it's not just about how we communicate that to the public. It's about how we do that with our staff too. Um, we have an amazing conservation and research department, but you know, they can't do everything. And so they made it um, very clear with an initiative in the zoo called the Conservation Action Specialist Program, where anyone in the zoo can then say, I really love this conservation project and I'm not in the conservation pro um, department, but I want to run that conservation project for the zoo. So we have a few conservation action specialists. I applied for mine last year. Um, and so I am the conservation action specialist for the Action Indonesia Global Species Management Plan. It's a conservation program that deals with Anoa, Bantang, Babarusa, and Sumatran tiger. Those are all Indonesian species. And we work very closely with the Indonesian government and the Indonesian Zoos and Aquariums Association um, in Indonesia to um, work on building that population in the wild and also sharing expertise within captive care um, and under human care in Indonesia and also in the U.S. So we share a lot of like our nutrition plans and things like that. What's the best diet for Bantang? Um, it's all a big of cow, by the way. Bantang, Bantang is a beautiful cow. Beautiful. Cow. They're beautiful cows from Gorgeous. Indonesia, by the way. Babarusa are the weirdest looking little pigs that you will ever see. You should definitely search them later. They are <clears throat> so weird and adorable and they're the best. Um, but we, all of our staff are conservationists too and have that opportunity to run a conservation program. And like Will said and, and, Rob said earlier, just coming to the zoo, a portion of your ticket goes towards conservationists. The people that come to the zoo are conservationists. And our job as employees at the zoo is to bolster that idea that you are a conservationist already. And there's a couple other things that maybe we can all do in our lives to benefit the planet a little bit more. Yeah, so there's another cool program that the zoo has where uh, it's called a job shadowing program. So other zoo employees can job shadow um, any other department. So say if I wanted to shadow Julia for her graphics work, I could sign up to do that. So we've had a few people come into the conservation department as well. So they get to go out into the field with us. They get to work um, firsthand with our gopher tortoises when we release them or look for them um, using the telemetry radio. And so that's a, a cool project where, you know, they can just get the experience that they've been wanting or just curious about and ask us any kinds of conservation questions as well. Yeah, we have a sea turtle uh, rehabilitation center at the zoo now that opened a couple of years ago. Um, and so, you know, it's really cool for us as employees. We can go and like just look at what turtles they have today. This one was cold stunned in, you know, cold. And then they'll take those turtles and re-release them. And that's a really cool opportunity to be part of conservation where that's open to staff as well. It's kind of like that job shadow program to allow for staff to participate in conservation. But it's 
allowing guests to also participate in conservation. Um, at Zoo Lights is an event that we have every year. Uh, we actually this year partnered with Moat. Moat Marine Lab is another AZA accredited aquarium out of uh, Sarasota. And they have a really, really cool con coral conservation program. And we are starting to get into coral conservation, getting our divers out in the water to start rebuilding the reefs around um, Key Largo. But during Zoo Lights, we invited them out and guests at Zoo Lights were able to come in and actually fragment, microfragment their own endangered corals. Those corals that went back to moats on land-based nursery in Key Largo. And they are currently still growing because it takes many months for them to yeah. grow. Um, and then they'll go out onto Key Largo's reefs and start to repatriate the reefs around uh, Key Largo and all of Miami, actually. The Florida Barrier Reef is actually the third largest barrier reef in the world, which blew my mind when I remember or I found this out and it goes all the way from Lake Okeechobee down through the Keys. Yeah. It's like 230 miles of coral reef just, just off the side of Florida. And 98% of this reef is now gone. Right. And that's right here. That's right off of our coast. And once we learned this, we were like, that this can't, we need can't to do something about this. Not we need to house. start doing something. Yeah. Um, and so we partnered with Moat and we are just at the beginning stages, but starting to work on how we can help with coral restoration. Also, we're a zoo, we're not an aquarium, but we have staff that are really passionate about corals and about the ocean in general. And, so, and we're right here. Everything that the ocean does affects us, right? And the animals that we have. And it's so really we were like, okay, let's do it. It's really tough to be land-based when you live in Miami, right? And Zoo Miami hasn't had a lot of uh, marine programs in the in the past, so we're really excited to actually be stepping off into the ocean a little bit more. Um, if you don't know about corals, it's like I can break it down really briefly. Like they are living organisms that live inside of a structure, right? And that structure is created by other organisms living in that same ecosystem. So what happens is if it gets too hot, or there's some sort of um, parasite or some sort of disease going through the coral community, what it happens is it's called bleaching. And all it is is the living organisms leave the structure. And so what this program does is it says, okay, that stinks over there. Something happened here, all the or living organisms left, but we have this other spot here with all of these really healthy living organisms. So we're going to make sure that there's more and more of them here so that we can take this living, happy, healthy coral and put it back over there. And then from there it can regrow again. But there's something you got to do first. You got to make sure it's not going to keep bleaching, right? You got to make sure that whatever disease, um, warming incident or whatever's going on um, doesn't continue because you put them back and then they just disappear again, right? So that's why you start seeing like big, big conservation initiatives that, um, that are asking you to vote on something or they're asking you to participate in something. And the idea there is that if everyone understands it and everyone does a little bit, that when the vote comes through and everyone speaks their voice, there's a lot more pressure behind it, a lot more push to make it better. And that's what we get to do as a zoo in, your, in our community is we get to connect people with the whole idea of what's going on so that when you can have a significant part in making a change for the better, that you understand what's going on and you say the right thing. Right. Um, and so that goes not only if we're talking about corals, but with the, the butterflies, you know, there's uh, we briefly touched on the tropical milkweed. There's this whole initiative about understanding which milkweed you want to have in your butterfly garden, because there's one that's good for native wildlife. And there's one that's not so good that actually just spreads diseases. And we don't want that. So we want to educate our community, but also show you the butterflies that you're helping when you make those choices. And that can be other things like um, like the tiger beetles, just, you know, maintaining important habitat for these species that need that space or for Florida panthers, making sure that there's a path for them to go from one safe place to another, which in Florida, which is a big peninsula cut by roads everywhere, creating those wildlife corridors with your panther license plate. If you guys have a FIU one, you could get one that also um, supports the wildlife, uh, the panther conservation um, program. So, um, so that's a little bit about us. That's a little bit about what we do. Um, and it's a lot of bit about conservation. So I hope you guys understand and see that, you know, Zoo Miami is a zoo, but we're a conservation organization that operates out of a zoo, not the other way around.
Um, so thank you. We're going to spend a little bit of time now. I think we have 15 solid minutes to, to have questions. Um, please, please, um, anything you guys want to talk about, that's why we're here. Um, so I don't want anyone to feel shy. I know there might be a few minutes of like, mm, I don't know if I want to say anything. I don't know. He's going to stare at me. He's going to look at me. Um, but we really appreciate your questions and it can be literally about all the different things that we just discussed. Yeah. Raf. Hi, thank you for all of that. Um, I had a question about like for anyone who wants to answer, but you know, in the recent years, um, like media has changed a lot, you know, with, with the popularity of like TikTok, you know, just the way that people consume media has changed a lot. I was wondering if that in any way has affected how you structure your events or how you structure your outreach and stuff like that too, for your vision. Yeah, definitely. Um, I can talk on this one. I, I would just simply say that we are informed not only by th the trends, the marketing trends, uh, other zoos, um, but also just what's popular, right? Like some kid captures his dad getting smashing his head into the garage and makes a million dollars nowadays, right? So like we have to be mindful that it, it doesn't, it's not always going to go to plan with what's going on. Um, but I think that's what's more important on our, our side is that like we're not here to chase trends. You know, we're not here to just make people, you know, like, oh, I saw that really funny thing on Zoom. We try to participate that when we have a good idea. But our main goal is that inspiring people to care about wildlife and want to help in the future. So that's what we focus our energy on. Having said that, we have a new marketing plan. We have a new marketing initiative. We have different people looking at all of those different things. And you'll start seeing more um, focused messages in our TikToks, in our Instagrams and everything else. Um, but they will still try to lend towards like, we understand when you're scrolling on the toilet that it doesn't really translate always to, you know, wildlife conservation. So we want to make sure we still catch your eye with some of the stuff we do. Um, if you guys look at the Instagram page uh, for Valentine's Day, we did a couple fun things. Um, and you might see me dressed like a flamingo. I don't know if you want to see it. But um, it, it was really enjoyable to do. And it took like 30 minutes out of our day to throw it together real quick with a little bit Bit of this is cool about flamingos and then something fun so i, th I think we, it depends we definitely do like we look at we look at trends definitely right because algorithms are a thing right. and we need to make sure that we are staying top of mind to a lot of people but then also making sure and building a plan where we can kind of meld that conservation story in with the other fun stuff believe it or not conservation can be really really fun yeah you just have to presented in a specific way yeah. um there's actually some really hilarious footage of gopher tortoises doing really funny things um that we are building videos for that will i'm sure sometime come out on social media Hashtag um, Miami. but there's some really cool <laughs> stuff you can do with conservation and then there's also like the the trends right but we just did like rob was talking about a little flamingo video which was hilarious and really funny and just seems really stupid but um it taught you a little bit about breeding behaviors for flamingos so there's ways that you can kind of meld in a conservation story with funny, trendy posts that we go out, that we put out. So we're also trying to do that. Um, but I think definitely public opinion and definitely the way trends are moving on social media, we don't want to be blockbuster, right? You want to make sure that you stay top of mind with whatever gener this next generation wants to do. And we need to be able to do that too. We need to meet you where you're at. Um, and if that means that's funny videos every once in a while, there's funny videos every once in a while, but we can also do the really serious conservation documentaries that may be on a different platform, for example. Yeah. Not everything is good for TikTok. There's some cool videos that are good for TikTok, but maybe on YouTube, our channel will have really serious documentaries on the butterfly bunker um, that will also come out soon on social right. media. Yeah. Yeah. But you can learn a lot of different things also and use those platforms in different ways. Um, and so TikTok does one thing and then Facebook's purpose is a little bit different and YouTube's purpose is a little bit different than that and using all of those to our advantage. Um, yeah, we definitely will say that um, we understand that whatever platform it is, even if it's X now um, or Meta or whatever the other things, that sometimes it's a snapshot of whatever we're doing without any interpretation. And that's where we have to be focused on making sure all of us are doing a great job all the time as best as we can to make sure that in those moments we still um, maintain that that goal the, the, and we still are stepping towards the, the success that we want to have. I think yeah. the key word there for us, like evolution, same thing as adaption. We just have to adapt to the environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't be blocked. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming. This was an amazing panel for sure. One of my favorite TTRs so far. Yes. Um, I wanted to, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about all the different programs that you have. You mentioned a lot, and I just wanted to ask, how do you make sure that they actually start and continue in a sustainable way for the long-term vision? Mm. That is an awesome question. So just on that note, which is an interesting one, and I'll let the, the team talk about it. As um, Julie was saying, AZA, so who we get accredited by, we have to evaluate all of our programs. So evaluation is a key part, but I'll let the other two go into how they like doing that. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think like Will said, we don't, we have so many ideas that never start because they we can't answer all the questions about what it's going to do what it's going to look like when we start it how we're going to roll it out who's going to be in charge of it like that's a big question going around right now who owns it right we don't start stuff if we don't know who's going to be in charge of it and and what set like we set a deadline we're going to reevaluate in a month and two months and six months um we need like this one might need some time to marinate before we really see it take you know like we we will go through each of those things and you'll see actually um with successful businesses and successful initiatives, um, there's a lot more you don't do than that you actually do do. Um, so I, I would just simply say that, like, you know, we have recently started some new encounters that we want people to participate in, um, and we are just getting to the precipice where we're going to, like, all right, do we keep doing these or we start on a new one? Um, so I would just say that we, we t constantly evaluate that. And um, for our conservation programs, too, like, one of the benefits of having the Conservation Action Specialist program is that we are able to kind of spread out the workload a little bit. Um, our conservation and research staff can't do everything. Um, and I tell you, there's only two of us. Yeah. So being able to spread out the conservation work with people that are passionate about specific things allows for those programs to move forward. There are checks and balances in place with, with the program that they created. Um, so we have to submit uh, reports to them once a month and there's an evaluation process that happens for that too. So you don't just get to like keep the title of conservation action specialist if you're not actually doing anything. Um, so there's definitely um, a process that's in place for that as well. And then always evaluating things, right? We want to make sure that what we're doing has efficacy for the programming and the messaging that we want to produce with that programming and that it's having the expected impact that we want. Um, so we do a lot of evaluation on our programs, but then also our conservation programs also. And being able to, a lot of that too, is we supply over $800,000 of funding a year for conservation programs that are happening all over the world. Um, those if we're giving a grant of five to ten thousand dollars to a conservation program, they are required to send us a report. Also, what you did with that funding, how did it support your ultimate goal, um, and it spreads out the resources that we have and the ability that we have to do those conservation programs by partnering with those other facilities so that it's not just something that happens once and then we can't sustain it long term. Sometimes we're partnering with them because we physically couldn't be able to sustain it long term, right. but they have that ability. And so that's why we create those partnerships too. Yeah. If you can show us you're going to be in charge of it, like it's a way easier way for us to say yes to the next thing for sure. Thank you so much. Great question. Um, hello. Um, I was wondering, what other organizations do you work with to help restore um, endangered animals or species? There are so many. Yeah, there's uh, lots. Um, Tiffany, you want to go first? So, uh, okay, I'll start with this one because it's entomology related. <laughs> um, so at the University of Florida, they have the McGuire Center of Lepidoptera, and that's where um, Dr. Jared Daniels does a lot of his research with endangered butterflies. So we have two endangered butterflies that both live in the Florida Keys. It's the Chalcis swallowtail and the Miami blue butterfly. They're both federally endangered, and they're both not looking good long term for climate change and sea level rise. Uh, partnerships with the uh, with the University of Florida um, provide us to be able to go out and do these butterfly surveys in the Keys, and so uh, many other agencies and um, and other volunteers are able to do that those butterfly surveys. Uh, we partnered again with Fairchild to try and do some other surveys for the host plants for the Miami blue butterfly. Um, all around these different parks in South Florida, even on the West Coast, to see where we could possibly put this butterfly back into the habitat, um, knowing that climate change and sea level rise is going to be a big issue. Um, 
let's see, we have like other programs like the iguana uh, conservation programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we actually, uh, I, I will just like try to give a comprehensive in that. The other thing about all of this is that we are one of two, over 230 AZA accredited zoos. So I could not only tell you about the programs we work with with the Florida agencies and the UF, US Fish and Wildlife um, on the programs that they support and they're looking for boots on the ground to get involved so that the, the work can be done itself like we talked about before. Um, but we, we also are organized with like Jacksonville Zoo on, on certain things. Like we both support the International Rhino Foundation. And so um, the International Rhino Foundation do only has like four people in the States, right? But one of them lives in Tampa. So we chat with her and we make sure that our rhino encounter is speaking properly to what they're, and we recently actually changed the conservation message in our rhino encounter to more properly um, articulate what's going on with greater one horn rhinos in India where she's working with them because she has pictures of getting rid of invasive plants and then putting in native species of grasses and then there's rhinos on the grass eating it, you know? And like how certain corridor programs um, actually from our funding and other zoos in the country's funding go to support an international company who created a corridor but there's like some bureaucracy going on but um, like they visited, I think they visited in January um, and she showed me a picture of two rhinos that had gone all the way through their corridor and then through a, a part that wasn't their corridor they were like yeah we're not waiting for bureaucracy and they just went to the protected space over here so um, it's super in, it's super exciting to know that we're making a difference by supporting people like that and that's that's sort of what we mean by when you take a step into the zoo you've already done your job you know um, our big main message is no action too small um, and sometimes that can seem like oh my gosh that message is blah 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 but like we want you to know that like if you do you know, the little things, then you're used to doing the little things. So when a big thing comes up, you're already like, oh, that, I already do those things, so I might as well help with that, right? Um, but there's, so there's, there's the national groups, there's the local groups, and then there's the international groups, and what's important is that um, we put all of them through those processes. You asked specifically about partners, and like essentially what I'm saying is the list is so long. Um, and so we have a conservation committee at the zoo that is made up of members of staff from all over the zoo. Yep. Um, and they make decisions on where that conservation funding goes through. So when someone submits a grant, for example, we have a grant process that they go through where I'm sure everyone at FIU understands a grant process and how to look through review grants. Um, we do that once a year also. Um, and we review all of the programs that are submitted to our grants program through a lens of we have like a three page checklist of things that we look for and things that we make sure that we don't want to be supporting or things that we do want to be supporting um, to do that. And then we have a grouping of funding that we do every year. Um, this is programs that are either staff led that our staff are really passionate about. And as long as our staff is passionate about it, then this is funding that will be submitted towards a specific organization that is working with one of our staff. Um, you know, our conservation and research department gets a lot of that. There's also the one that I work with, Action Indonesia. Um, that's an active program that we work with um, on a daily basis. And so there's funding that goes towards that. So there's different funding that um, are make sure that that list is sustainable and we're able to um, meet all of those things while still supporting the organizations that are really important to the zoo itself. Um, like the International Rhino Foundation, for example. Something recently that we've been involved with partnerships is to do with manatee rehab and rescue. So this has just recently come out on our social media that we were actually supporting different facilities, so Surf Life Sea World and Bush Gardens and Zoo Tampa, but working with the MRP, which is the Manatee Release Program, and that's a rehab and release program, which is that Shizu Miami have just been accepted onto because we are going to be starting to dip our toe more in working with manatees, as we we're saying. Yet they are around Florida. There is a major issue with them, so we are working in that sense. Um, but that is a perfect example of government agencies, facilities, and ourselves coming together and actually working for the same cause in that sense. And and I'm sure you've seen with manatees, uh, everyone 
everyone sees how they are but that's something we're definitely getting involved with very similar to the sea turtles same sort of way in that sense yeah. so. i'll add one more uh usgs and so uh, my supervisor dr frank ridgely actually implants uh radio transmitters into these pythons in everglades and they use that to track where the pythons nest and so they can learn behaviors of the pythons in order to control the python uh, population in everglades so that's a big partner of ours definitely Awesome. We want to be respectful of time. I know it's 1.30 right now. Did we have, we, we have time. I just want to make sure you guys um, might have to get to class or midterms or whatever is going on. But um, we can take more questions. Um, I just wanted to hear more about the undergraduate programs or how we could personally get involved. As you mentioned, I'm um, personally the volunteer coordinator for the Pre-Vet Society here. So I know okay. a lot of people that would love to get more involved and learn more about especially exotics, which is more underrepresented in like a day-to-day -day life. Sure. So we have... The, did you say vet, pre-vet? Yes. Yeah, we have the One Health program mm -hmm. yeah. that we work with and we, we do that as well. Um, and I know that we do have a partnership with FIU for veterinary students, I believe. Yeah, so um, I don't know the the selection process for the program. Um, thank you guys for coming, by the way, for those of you who have to bounce. Thank you so much. Um, but I know we have a particular vet that is in charge of that. Dr. Schnellenbacher is our, you know, he receives the inquiries. Um, bye bye. And so I, I would just simply say, like, let me give you my email and then I can connect you. If you if you're the volunteer coordinator, I can connect you with our Zoo Miami volunteer coordinator um, because we have interns, we have externs. After they get their vet degree, they come to do like their rounds or their externship with us, and we see new faces in the hospital all the time. So they're constantly bringing people in that want to help us with you know a bird with a broken leg or you know a snake that we found or this iguana thing or help Dr. Frank with his surgeries on the on the pythons to put the transmitter in and um, there's a lot I mean there's dentists that come in that volunteer they're like a whole weekend or a whole week of their time like human dentists and they come in and they're like well you got primates it's the same thing so they come in and they do like root canals and you know I mean it's not the same thing but you know what I mean um, you know and then we have you know dog and cat doctors that come in and they're so much faster because they're so used to doing those same surgeries over and over again that they our vets will save specific stuff for them so I'll be happy to share uh, I'll give you my email um, and all that what <laughs> dog, dog and cat, cat doctors. Yeah, dog and cat doctors. Sorry. <laughs> and to the point, we're not getting kicked out of this space, so I know that we're gonna we're gonna say goodbye right now. And if you schedule those between your classes, thank you very much for being here. Totally understand if you need to get your things. But if you do want to hang out, introduce yourself, meet some of our panelists, talk to the global learning team, we're not getting kicked out. We're here for you. <laughs> One more round of applause for this fantastic panel. Thank you guys so yes. much for being here. Awesome. Next, nice. week, next week is spring break, so we obviously do not return. Then, Godspeed and have fun in whatever it is that you're doing. Please make sure to be safe. But join us again in two weeks where we have kind of a really great compliment for today's session. Um, we have Professor Clinton Jenkins from Earth and Environment coming to talk to us about special places in bio, for biodiversity. So different kinds of perspectives on both local, local, global, and international efforts for biodiversity. That'll be a, a really cool one. Awesome. Um, and three weeks, so the week after that, we also have our New York Times speaker series where we welcome a New York Times journalist so feel free there's definitely lots of promo around that on March 12th that'll be over in 140 because we definitely expect a bigger crowd so definitely follow us on social media and we encourage you to come back see you again soon thanks so much.